Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mercedes. I'm with Rocky Nook. I'm happy to have you all here and to host Dan Bailey today. Uh, his new book, Fujifilm X Series Unlimited, is out and available now. And he's here today to tell us five things that you should know about your Fujifilm X Series camera. Um, a little bit about Dan, if you're unfamiliar. Dan has been a full-time adventure, outdoor, and travel photographer since 1996. His immersive first-person style of shooting often places him right alongside his subjects as he documents the unfolding scene and searches for the perfect convergence of light, background, and moment. A longtime user of Fuji Photo Film, Dan first became enamored with the X-Series in the fall of 2011. His photography blog is one of the top-rated photography blogs on the planet. Currently shooting full-time with the X-T2, Dan has shot extensively with the entire lineup of X-Series cameras. Dan currently lives in Anchorage, Alaska, and he spends his free time flying his little yellow Cessna, hiking and skiing in the mountains, and touring on his mountain bike. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, because I know you all came here for him, and he's going to fill you in on five things you should know about your Fujifilm camera. As, as the chat's going on and as the webinar's happening, go ahead and submit your questions to Dan in the chat, and I'll monitor them and pass them over to him as necessary. And uh, Dan, you can take it from here. Thanks, Mercedes, uh, and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased. This is actually my first official webinar, so I'm, I have to remember to look at the at the camera and not down here. Uh, yeah, this is my first official webinar, so I'm really psyched. Uh, I'm I'm honored to be here with Rocky Nook. Uh, as you saw, they published my new as you saw, they published my brand new book. Uh, Fujifilm X Series Unlimited, which is the print version of my popular ebook, and they did an outstanding job. The cover is beautiful. The, the format is amazing. Uh, the text, the layout—it's—it's it's top notch. It's the most. It, it, they did an awesome job. So thanks to Rocky Nook for that. Uh, show of hands, uh, who has the book already? So, um, I guess we, we can talk about that later. Uh, I've prepared five five topics that I want to talk about, uh, and, and we're gonna I'm not just gonna blabber on the whole time. I want to definitely take your questions because I know that's why a lot of you tuned in to ask me personal questions. So I've got five topics, and these are things that I think that each X-series photographer should know. Uh, there's so many things that the cameras can do, um, and that's why I wrote the book because they're the manuals only go so far, and I, I want to, as an instructor, I like to see people get the most from their photography. You know, I, I love photography, and I know that you all do as well. And just because I'm a pro doesn't mean I love it anymore. And whether you're shooting a cool scene where I am, it feels the same to everyone when you nail the shot. When you get all your settings right, and the moment and the light turn out in your favor, it all feels the same, and that moment feels great. So I, I like to help you guys get those scenes and, and, and be creative and, and push your photography to new boundaries. So I've got a few notes here, but I'm going to, I'm going to sometimes break and show you some photos. But the first topic we're going to talk about are the camera controls. So here's my X-T2. And I know that a lot of you have X-T2s as well, uh, although you might have some of the other models. But the nice thing about the Fujis is that they have a lot of continuity across the line. And the number one thing about the X-Series is that they have a nice traditional layout of the camera controls. You've got metal dials that control shutter speed, aperture, you have aperture rings right on the lenses. And let's uh, let go here for a bit. So here's an X-T2, and you can see on the top deck you have the ISO dial, you've got a shutter speed dial, and exposure compensation. And then you have a working aperture ring on the lens. Most of the lenses have numbered aperture rings, and this is my X-T2, this is what I do with mine. Uh, and as an official X-T2 abuser, I can assure you that uh, they work down to minus about 20 degrees. So I left this out all night on the tripod just to see if it would work, and it did. The, 
most cameras these days have got a lot of menus and the X-Series do as well, but the tactile feel of the controls allow you to have basically fingertip control of your main settings. And with that, you can control the parameters of your exposure triangle, which are shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And if you like to use aperture priority mode, you've got at working aperture or manual, you've got aperture rings right on the lens. And uh, that's one of my favorite things about the X-Series, and that was one of the things that drew me back to Fujifilm is the cameras look like cameras. And as I said, there's continuity across the line. So here's an X-T20, and you've got the drive dial on the left, you've got shutter speed and exposure compensation, and if you had a lens on there, you'd probably have an aperture ring as well. And then you have two control rings, and even the brand new XT100, which is just out, or I think is out very soon, you have a couple of command dials that can be programmed to control drive and shutter speed and, and uh, exposure compensation. But the thing that, the thing that I like a lot, the thing that I like best about the X-Series is when I'm shooting, I don't have to go into the menus to change my settings. And I see a lot of people holding the cameras different ways, but as someone who came from film cameras where we always had aperture rings, I think this is the most efficient way to hold the camera. Obviously right hand on the, on the body, but cradling the, the lens with your left hand. And that gives you, not only does it give you stability, when you suck your shoulders in, you kind of have a tripod, especially when you place the camera to your eye, you hold the camera steady, but you've also got fingertip control right in your aperture ring. This is not quite as efficient because your arm is kind of out here. But if you have your if you have your arm sucked in like this, it creates a natural brace for the camera. Plus, you just look more professional. And that's really what it's all about. So with uh, let's see, let's go back to here. <clears throat> So when you're holding the camera, yeah, let's do this. It's my first webinar, I'm a little rusty. So when you're holding the camera, you know, I, I like to shoot in aperture priority mode. And so my right hand is on, you've got your shutter speed dial, your exposure compensation, and your aperture. And really, you control your aperture ring with, you control your shutter speed with your aperture. So all you're doing you need to do is have shoot aperture and then control your exposure. If you like to do shutter priority, same thing. You, you set your shutter and you set the aperture to the A mode and then you're golden. You just set whatever shutter speed you want. Manual, same thing. You've got shutter speed and aperture ring. So with all those modes, you're just changing, you're changing aperture, shutter speed and ISO with dials. You don't have to go into the menus and say, oh, well, I need to shoot this mode and change this. So I'd like to get in the habit of using these dials, and especially with the ISO dial, you know, the, whether you use auto ISO or whether you spin the dial for manual aperture or manual ISO control, it doesn't really matter. The, app, the, the ISO performance on these cameras is so good that I, I like to play a game called ISO Who Cares? I usually keep my ISO set at 200, but if I'm in a scene and I fast breaking scene and the light's changing, or if I need a faster shutter speed, I'll just spin it. I'll just grab it and spin it, and I sometimes won't even look where it is. And right now I just spun it to 1,000, and I have no problem shooting this camera at 1,000 ISO, or 3,200 or 1,600. So don't worry about being precise with ISO. If you need a faster shutter speed, if you need more light, just crank the dial or put it on auto ISO, and I think you won't have any problems there. So let me just look at my notes here. Oh, one more thing. On the shutter speed dial, you have a T, and that stands for T mode or time. And if you put the, the, the shutter speed dial on T, then your shutter speed control is actually done with the command dial. And you can either set it for 
the front command dial or the rear command dial. And that's one of the things you can change in the button dial settings. And I talk about all the stuff in my book, all the settings. Um, so let's, um, that's kind of the end of the first topic. You know, just to recap, manual controls, get in the habit of using, hold your camera with the aperture ring in your left hand. And, you know, you can shoot all day, all month without ever going to the menu. And between, you know, if you're, if you know photography well, you know that shutter speed, aperture, and ISO is your exposure triangle. Those are the three things needed to make a picture. And if that's all you need to do to shoot great photos, then you don't have to spend time in the menus. So let's uh, let's, let's break there and and bring, ask some questions. Hey there, Dan. So we've got some good questions today coming in already. Um, I'm getting a little tired of hearing just hearing myself do this. One that I'm going to ask because it's pertinent to me and you is uh, a few people have asked as as a glasses wearer, how do you deal with light infiltration into the viewfinder when shooting in bright sunlight? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think my answer is that I've spent so many years shooting that my glasses are sort of permanently smashed towards my face on this side. And uh, the X-T2 has a nice big eye cup. The light might be better here. The X-T2 has a nice big eye cup. And so when I press my eye, my glasses to, to that eyepiece, I can kind of cover the whole lens of my glass, and my glasses, and then I kind of prevent light leak. The X-T1 didn't have as big an eye cup. Uh, and I'm not sure if all the other models have as big an eye cup. But a lot of times they're replaceable. But the X-T2 and the X-H1 and probably the GFX as well, uh, they do have the bigger eye cup. Thanks. This okay, is really for me, I have to say. I've done a lot of classes and workshops and presentations, but when I have an audience in front of me, I have feedback and I can kind of respond to people. So it's a little awkward just to sit here and talk. So more questions. Well, more questions. I can better. tell you the response in, in the chat is is pretty well. People people seem to be enjoying it so far. Cool. Um, and there are a lot of questions coming in, probably more than I can keep up with or more than we'll get to, but we'll certainly try. Oh, oh um, I have some questions here, too. Yep. Um, um, so someone's asking, how can I turn off the LCD during playback? Uh, they say they have the camera set for EVF only, but and the LCD will be enabled during playback, which is not a good situation when they're doing night photography. Okay. Let's see. LCD. Or, so you want EVF only, right? So, eye sensor only. Uh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. That I actually oh, there it is. I have I have my camera set. When you look through the viewfinder, you press the little view mode until it says EVF only. And I did that, and now I only have playback inside the eyepiece. I can see it. I, I, I can see the playback in there, but I can't see it on the viewfinder. So I think you have to be looking through when you press the view mode button. All right. Applause. Thanks, Let's Martin. See. <laughs> um, someone has said that they lost the round, small round plug on the front that covers the sensor. And is that a big deal? The small round plug that covers, uh, does, does that mean the body cap? Uh, because there's all these little plugs too. I've lost my plug for the, the terminal. Um, uh, she it, didn't specify. If she's still in the chat here, if she wants to send in some more information, we yeah, can come back to that body, question. If it's the body cap, uh, I'm sure you could go to a store and maybe they have an extra or call 1-800-800-FUJI. Is the is the Fuji uh, technical helpline, and they can probably help you as well. Great, um, Janelle. I know. I know Janelle. How's it going? Oh, great. Uh, I've got one question. One more question for you, and then you can get back to. Um, I know you have a few more things you want to teach us about. Um, let's see. Kevin says that you know the batteries don't last in cold weather, even when using every setting focus in manual. So do you have any tips 
apart from putting the battery in your underwear to keep them warm? Uh, I've actually never put the battery in my underwear. Um, I suppose that would work. I, I typically will put them in a zipper pocket in my jacket. And in the wintertime, I'm often wearing multiple layers that have, uh, I might have a, a shirt with an inner pocket. So I try to put them as close to my body as they can. And oftentimes I'll put a heat pack in there as well as little chemical hand heater packs with the heat factory. And I'll always carry at least two or three batteries in the wintertime. And sometimes if the battery dies in the camera, you can take it out, put it into a warm area, and then swap it out, and the, you'll get a little more juice back. And so in the wintertime, sometimes it's a matter of swapping out warm batteries for cold ones, and the cold ones might still have a charge. So All right. Always uh, carry uh, more, more batteries. So Colin says, do you convert to DNG? Uh, that, I actually got an email from a guy about that this morning, and my answer is no. Uh, I, I see the whole DNG thing as kind of an Adobe, an unnecessary step. Uh, Adobe kind of led us all to believe that we needed DNG because format and computers and cameras might not be compatible in, in, in the future, but my software still reads raw files from every camera that I still have. And so I, I just see it as an un unnecessary step to convert to DNG. Maybe I'll convert a single DNG file to send to a client because it has the develop metadata in it, but I, I just see no reason to convert all my files to DNG. Great. Um, we can come back to some more questions a little bit later. And I just okay. want to make a note that they're coming in really fast. Okay. Um, so what I'll do, just so everyone knows, we'll still come back to questions in this webinar. But at the end, Dan, I can send you the chat tra transcript. So you can go through and read. And if there's any questions in there you really want to answer, we can address that in, in a blog post or something like that. Because I know people just have so many questions and, and I know we're not going to get to them all. So I'll yeah, let you get yeah. back to your presentation. Yeah, and that's actually a good idea. And I will do that. Uh, I'll go through the questions and I'll do a blog post and I'll pick out a number, as many as I feel like answering at the time. Uh, and so that would be a good way to answer this. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is customizing your camera. And let's see, if I do this, um, Okay, so customizing the camera. One of the things about the X-Series cameras, hang on. All right, Hit the wrong button. One of the, thing, one of the things about the X-Series cameras is that they have very customized control. Uh, here's the back of the X-T2. You can see the four D-pad buttons. Uh, there's AEL and AFL button. There's a, another button on the top, a Wi-Fi button, and then there's another button on the front as well. And then you have the pressable dial on the back too. So every camera has a number of function buttons. And most of the X-Series cameras have eight function buttons. In addition, you have the Q menu. And so these are two places where you can store commonly used settings. And they come pre-configured. So each, each camera has a set of, each camera has a set of pre-programmed settings for all the function buttons and, and dedicated Q menu settings. And you can change those. Uh, with, the, with the X-T2, I found that a few of them make a lot of sense. So I, I keep some of the stock ones, but some of my change. The ones that I like to keep, uh, I always like to have, uh, before, before we talk about that, in order to change your function button settings, you simply hold the display back button down until you get this menu that you see right here. And once you get that, you can use the, the control buttons to navigate down through the menu and change which function button you want to change. And there, I think on the X-T2, there's about 32 different choices. So depending on the style of photography you like to do or what kind of a shooter you are or what settings you typically use, you can pre-configure your function buttons 
So they reflect that shooting style. So again, you don't have to go into the menus and dig down. You can have one button press and bring up that setting. So for example, on the top example here, you have shutter mode. And so that's, you know, the example here is function one set to shutter. The X-series cameras have an electronic shutter, which allows you to go up to 32 thousandths of a second, which is incredibly fast. You, you know, super shallow apertures and very bright sunlight or capturing extremely fast subject matter. So maybe you want to have your, your electronic shutter set. You can have fingertip control. But as you might know, there are some scenes where electronic shutter doesn't work very well. Uh, for me, I've seen propellers and extremely fast movement tends to have a funny look to it. And that's just the way the, 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 the rolling electronic shutter works. It doesn't do action in really fast motion well. So instead of having to go into the menus and change back to manual shutter or mechanical shutter, you could simply set a function button, which would just one, to one button press and you go electronic, manual or manual plus electronic, or mechanical and so forth. So if you have you know, uh, focus modes or white balance, uh, some of the other choices that you might wanna use are histogram, a preview picture effect, which we're gonna talk about in the next section, uh, the brand new firmware, which was released today for the X-T2. Last month, Fuji released a firmware for the X-T2 that was, it had some bugs since they recalled it, but today they re-released the new version. So I encourage you to update that. And one of the features was larger indicators, so larger, uh, larger text in the viewfinder. Uh, auto ISO settings, self-timer, again, shutter type, uh, focus modes, those are all things that you can set as function buttons. Uh, another place you can set for a quick control is the My Menu. And this is found in the user settings down the wrench here. And when, once you put something in the My Menu, whenever you hit the Menu button, that's the first thing that will come up. Instead of, you know, if you don't have anything in the My Menu, the image quality menu comes up first. But as soon as you put something in My Menu and start to fill it up, that's the first thing that comes up when you hit the menu button. So again, here is where you can put things that you like to change quickly. Maybe you don't need immediate fingertip control, but instead of, again, digging down through the menus, you hit it once and it's right there. And you can, there's uh, two pages. I believe you can do, um, I guess you can do two pages in the My Menu. You might be able to do three. I'm, I'm, I'll have to check the manual on that. Uh, or my book. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Q menu is another place you can put custom custom functions. So, um, you're paying the wrong button. Okay, and. Okay, so let's go back to uh, let's go back to here. So let, just to recap, the X series cameras allow you to customize in order varying by your style. So with the function buttons, the Q menu, and the My menu, you can put your commonly used settings for fingertip control or very fast uh, access without having to dig down the menus. And as I said, the XT2 has uh, about 30. 32 different settings. Most of the other cameras have close to that. There's just a few settings the X-T2 has that the other ones don't have. Um, but yeah, you can set those according to the style and type of photography that you like to do. So again, you know, classic camera that you love to use that's, that, that feels like it feels good in your hands and it's programmed in a way that that's, makes it personally yours. So more questions? <laughs> Hey there, we can get to some more questions. Um, yeah. A few people have noted <laughs> that some of your tips seem to focus on the X-T2. Um, are there things that you would say are applicable to both the X-T2 and other cameras, or are there um, certain things that maybe aren't specific to the X-T2 that 
um, the other cameras share that you could talk about? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Uh, I, I, I do talk about the X-T2 a lot because that's the camera I use mostly. And that's the camera that has the most amount of features. Uh, but what you'll find with the X-Series is that almost all of the cameras have a common set of features. And the, the X-T2 and the X-H1 have a few features that the other ones don't have. But oftentimes those are catching up. For example, there were features that were in the X-T2 that appeared in the X-E3 with the firmware when that came out. And then with the firmware update, they came into the X-T20. And so a lot of these things just keep getting propagated up into the model. Uh, but really, almost all of the features that I talk about, all of the features that I talk about will be applicable to all the cameras. There's a few settings that are specific that may not be in every model, and that's where you need to refer to your manual. But all of the things that I talk about today, and most of the things I talk about on my blog and in the book, are applicable to all the models. And in the book, I, I try to specify if there's settings that only apply to a specific model. All right, here's another That's question. The next series is that their settings are common across all models. So you can seamlessly go between, between cameras and have all the same, almost all the same features. Great. Great. Uh, one question that was asked that a couple of people seem interested in is focus bracketing. Um, Craig asks if you have any recommendations on that those settings. It seems to want to shoot a large number of frames. I haven't tried focus bracketing yet. Uh, yeah, I, I people some people have asked me about that. I'm going to have to play around with that because honestly, I haven't tried it out yet. That focus bracketing is one of the new firmware things that went into the XT2 recently and the GFX as well, and I just haven't tried it yet. Okay. Uh, let me see what else I had in here. Terry says she loves her X-T1 in the UK. I love the UK, and I love my X-T1 as well. Jeremy asked uh, about the X-T2. He asks, what's the best way to keep focus selection on face detection? Uh, he said the focus area seems to float from shot to shot. Uh, so face detection floats. Um, if you have multiple multiple faces in there, it, it may float. You can try activating uh, either the the eye, the auto and the, the, there's face on, eye auto, eye left, eye right. Uh, so you might play around with those. Um, I, I think if you usually the face detection tracks well, but if you have multiple faces, that I found it it can switch. But I, I haven't found it to be very then infallible. It seems to work pretty well. Um, somebody just asked me if I use primes or zooms. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the primes. I love the little primes. I have the 50 f2 on here. Uh, that's one of my favorite lenses. I like the 35 f2, the 14 28 uh, is my favorite wide angle, uh, and the 90. I, I, the only zooms I really use are the two longer ones, the 50 to 140 and the 100 to 400. Well, I do have the, the 18 and 135 as well. I, that's a pretty good lens. Although, and I will say that I, after a couple of years of neglect, I pulled out my 55 to 200 this week, and I started shooting some landscapes with it. And I really fell in love with it again. It's a great lens. It's super light. Much easier to carry than the 50 to 140. Um, I think you have a couple more tips for us before we uh, take a few more questions. Is that right? Yeah. Let's get into the next right. one. The next one is... Uh, Next one will be more fun, I promise. <laughs> now that we got the kind of technical camera button stuff out of the way. So <clears throat> the next section that I'm going to talk about are the film simulations. Uh, I, I know that not everyone understands the, the method behind why the film simulations were put in the cameras and how to use them to the fullest extent. So I'm going to give you a rundown on, on how I use them and how I believe they were kind of meant to be used and the advantages that they offer. So I'm going to Go back to my slides here. Okay, so Fuji used to make film, as you probably all know, and they have some very classic films um, that a lot of pros love. Velvia was my favorite. Uh, it, it was a favorite of almost all the outdoor photographers. When Velvia came out, it 
pretty much blew the market apart and everyone fell in love with it overnight because it has such rich, beautiful, bold colors and strong shadows. For example, this picture here, which we chose for the cover of the book, uh, that's, a, that's used the Velvius film simulation. And so the film simulations, when, when they designed the X-Series cameras, they, they decided to put in a very specific set of color palettes that, that closely matched those storied films. And I was talking to a product manager recently, and he said, oh, yeah, some of the guys when we were developing the X-Series, they didn't think that was important. They didn't want to put them in there, but we, we fought for it. And, and it's, I think it's an incredibly smart thing that they did. So I think that's what, one of the things that sets the X-Series and the Fuji cameras apart from all the other systems. Every camera today takes great pictures, but there's something special about the Fuji colors. And if you ask anybody who's used Fuji film in the past and, and people who die hard Fuji users, they'll tell you that the colors are why they love the system so much, or they, they, why they use love the film so much. So with the film simulations, and most of the cameras have 15 film simulations. There's a number of classics. There's, there's some color film sims. There's Provia, Velvia, Astia, Classic Chrome, the two ProNeg film sims, Acros, black and white, and Monochrome, and then Sepia. And with those, and, and with, the, with the two Monochromes, the Acros and the Monochrome, you have red, green, blue, yellow, red, green, yellow filter selections as well. So as if you were shooting black and white with those color filters. So what you get with that packet of film simulations is a diverse but limited selection of color palettes that allow for a very wide amount of creative expression without overwhelming you. As we all know, we have too many choices in life. We have too many channels on the TV, too many shows to watch on Netflix, and too many books to read, too many everything, too many sliders to slide in Lightroom. And that's where the film simulations are great because you have, like I said, a, a very small number of choices, but they're diverse enough that they offer a lot of creativity. And so here's how I use them. You know, that I was a huge Velvia fan. I used Velvia film for years, and now I love using the Velvia film simulation. I love the rich, bold colors. And when I'm shooting with Velvia, and, and to be clear, most of all, mo all of these pictures are straight JPEGs out of the camera. And that's, that's part of the deal is that the Fuji JPEGs are so good right out of the camera, the image processors are so good, that I rarely ever find the need to shoot raw. Because if I'm putting the... If I'm putting the camera on Velvia mode and I'm shooting and getting pictures like this straight out of the camera, then I'm happy. I'm a happy camper. And so I feel I've gone back to a film like approach with my photography. When you shot, when people shot film, we put a very specific role in the camera, type of film, and we shot the photo. And when you got your slide back, what you got is what you got, and that was the picture. And there was no, there was no taking it back and sliding sliders and manipulating it and processing all your photos. And so there's something cool about that picture being the picture that you shot in the moment. So when I'm standing on top of a mountain in the sunset, and I've got all these great experiences running through my system, and I shoot the photo, and I walk away with the final picture that I love, that's my goal. I don't want to walk away with a bunch of files that I have to go process later because when I get home, I'm going to have to I'm going to be busy with everything else. And then I have to sit at my computer and process photos. And besides, everybody needs to say, hey, you got back from your trip. Can we see your pictures? And you have to say, well, no, I haven't processed them all yet. Well, if I'm just shooting, relying on those Fuji colors and shooting JPEGs and coming away with pictures that I love, then I can share them immediately and I can save my processing time. And... The important thing is, is I'm not deferring my creative decisions until later. You know, a month later when I sit down, I get back from my trip, and I sit down at my computer, I'm so far removed from the actual experiences and emotions I had when I was standing on top of that mountain in the sunset, hearing the wind in my ears and hearing the birds and, you know, 
you know, hearing the water roar off the, the waterfall on the you know dirt flines, my friends coming down the hill on his mountain bike. Those experiences are burned into my memory and they're, they're therefore burned into the image as well because I'm walking away with an image that reflects that instead of trying to recreate, trying to shoot a flat raw pictures and recreate that later. And so, so much of the time I'm using Velvia, but that's not all. Uh, you know, here's a few more Velvia shots. And the, again, these are all straight JPEGs out of the camera. And with pictures like this, I, I find no need to sit in my computer and process. Uh, Velvia typically works great in bright sunshine, with great colors, blue skies, you know, red, nice brightly colored jackets, people scenes, uh, bike race, you know, any kind of rich dynamic scene in the world. But you don't have to make your colors vivid and rich every single time. And that's one of the great things about photography is that it's, an, it's a, a symbolic art form. You're not out to replicate the scene as is. You're out to reproduce and abbreviate the scene and tell a story. And sometimes that means muting the tones a little bit or using a different color palette. So here's a Veldia shot, but here's an Astia shot. And Asti is a little bit better skin tones and not quite so bold. It's got good colors, but it's not just so over the top color. So it kind of pulls back those rich colors a little more. And the same thing, here's, if I had shot this in Velvia, that the blues on his shirt would pop a little bit too strongly and the skin tones would be a little too red. Uh, here's one of the Proneg simulations. The, those are patterned after some of Fuji's print portrait film, not quite so much contrast, not so much rich color, but you, you still get the feel and the emotion of the shot, even if you pull the colors back. Here's another pro neg scene where you're pulling the colors way back. And it, in fact, it looks like monochrome until you look up at the mountain and you see a tiny little twinge of blue in the shadows on that peak. So here's a, a, one of the pro neg, pro neg low. And to me, this looks very film-like. And again, I'm walking away with, with pictures that I love. And they have different, you know, different looks that reflect ideas that I might have in the moment or different types of abbreviation or symbolism or feelings that I'm trying to evoke. Here's a classic chrome shot. You know, it doesn't need to be rich and saturated. It doesn't need to be super colorful. It has that classic look. And as we all know, cl classic chrome was modern after Kodachrome, which is one of the most famous films of all time, has a very journalistic style of feel, which since it pulls the colors back, it gives you a color palette that's much more muted and it forces the viewer to focus more on the content of the picture and the story and the shapes. And then of course the monochrome, is acros and black and white, acros and monochrome, which they're very similar. If your camera doesn't have acros, then the monochrome is perfectly fine. They're both beautiful. Acros is a little bit better grain structure in the in the higher ISOs, but that's just because it's only found on the cameras with the higher processors, the X-T2 and the X-E3. Basically, all the newer models have that. But again, when you take the colors away, you force the viewer to focus on shape and story and your tonal variations. And so sometimes color is pretty cool, but black and white can have a lot of impact. And again, here's the black and white. Here's the Velvia. Add a little bit of color back, and it's just a different story. So I really like to tell the story that I saw in the moment based on the ideas I had. And you know, these are two very different, two very different pictures. You know, this is in front of Loch Ness, which is kind of an eerie place. It was a sunny afternoon until we got to Loch Ness, and then all these squalls and clouds and storms are rolling over. And it just didn't seem like a bright, sunny, colorful picture would, would do it justice, where a more muted color palette would work better. Uh, here's a scene, here's a Velvia shot, which has a lot of color, but I felt that pulling the colors back gave it a more gritty look. This made it a little more powerful. And I, I liked the, the, the scene 
I like to be able to portray the scene in different ways and I can walk away, I can do those right in camera. And I can also vary the look of the film simulations by using the highlight and shadow tone controls, which you find in the Q menu. Uh, I talk about that in the book. If you like, if you do some of those adjustments, you can save them as a custom setting and you can pull those up another time if you come up with a combination you like. You can, if, if you don't like the film simulations, I know that not everybody does. I know that some people still prefer to shoot in RAW. And there's a setting called picture, turn picture preview effect off. It's in the screen settings menu. If you, if you prefer to shoot in RAW and you don't wanna see the film simulations because you're just gonna do processing later, if you turn pre preview picture effect off, your viewfinder will go flat and you'll see the straight scene without any coloration from the film simulations. But me, I like the film simulations. I like to shoot as if I'm, I like to shoot as if I'm shooting with film again, making conscious choices about the scene, the emotions I have and the story I want to tell. So I would encourage you to try the film simulations and, and try shooting JPEG only and just seeing what you get. So, more questions. <laughs> hey there, Dan. William, said, William Fields says, strongly disagree with the bit on JPEGs. Post-processing is, is part of making the picture, which is analogous to uh, wet room, working, developing film. I totally agree. And that's the beautiful thing about photography is that it's, it can be done any way you choose. It's, you can do photography to your heart's content and if you love to process photos, I agree, that can be a very valuable and very joyous, immersive, creative act for some people. Uh, there are some scenes, there are some times where I do like to process photos, but a lot of times I'm, I like the approach of shooting as if I were shooting film. So I don't want to discount raw because the Fuji cameras have shoot great raw photos. And if you do like to process, then by all means, take full advantage of the Fuji raw file. Uh, Lynn asked if some of the film simulation features offer filters, does that negate the need to use actual physical filters in every case? Uh, the black and white sims, the Actos and the monochrome have settings that replicate the red, green, and yellow filters using black and white. So, so from, yeah, you, if you were going to shoot black and white, you don't have to use those filters. Uh, the thing with digital photography is that if you don't use filters, you can always, most filters do an effect. They either change the color or some a neutral density filter can darken it or you can have a grad, grad neutral density filter which will darken a part of the picture. You can still use those, but with digital photography, a lot of what filters do can be replicated in post-processing like Photoshop and Lightroom. Let me see here. Andrew asked if you use the Fuji RAW conversion software, and if you do, do you have any tips? Uh, Fujifilm X RAW Studio uh, is a software that came out a few months ago. Uh, I haven't used it very much, but I played a little bit with it, and it does have one big advantage. Uh, when you shoot RAW and upload those RAW into, into Lightroom and even Luminar, Lightroom doesn't Lightroom trashes your color profile, trashes the film simulation profile, and it applies its own Adobe profile. The Fuji X RAW Studio software acts like the camera in the in camera raw processing. And it allows you to apply the exact color profile of whatever film whatever film simulation you want back into the file. So you could shoot a Velvia photo in RAW, upload it to X RAW Studio, and decide, well, let's see how this looks in Pro Neg Low and you'll get an exact look uh, with the exact film simulation profiles. So I haven't used it much, but it does solve a really cool problem. And I do think it's, it's a, uh, a worthwhile thing to try. Um, let me see what else has come in here. Um, people are asking how to use the highlight and shadows controls while shooting. Uh, that's it. That's a good question. I, for, long, for the longest time, I didn't know what those with those did in my camera. I, I just 
always ignore the H tone and S tone options in the Q menu. When I started playing around with them, I, I figured out you have even, they give you even more control over basically processing your photo while you shoot it. So with a shadow tone, you have up to, I think, plus four and minus two. And plus is always adding more contrast and minus is reducing contrast. So if you have a really contrasty scene and super dark shadows, you can go to the minus setting and pull those back and reduce the contrast in your scene. Or if you have a low contrast scene and you want to just pump up the shadows and make a little more dynamic look, you can go plus side on the shadow tone. Same with highlights. If you have a, a really bright scene, you want to pull those back a little bit. It, it won't. If you have a highlight that's totally blown, the highlight tone isn't going to rescue it, um, but it will pull it back a little bit so it's not so obtrusive. And the same thing with the plus. If you have something you want to just add a little more contrast, uh, that helps. And, and so I use those uh, as a technical aid, but I also use them as a creative aid. So a lot of times I'll, I'll put the camera on, say, Classic Chrome, which has a muted color profile, and I might pump the, cla the, the shadow tone up to give it more contrast. And it might even pull the color back, the color control as well. So I could have a neutral color balance, a neutral color palette that's even less saturated but more shadows. And it just kind of varies the, the look and feel of your photos. All right. The questions seem to be slowing down a little bit now. So I want to give you a chance, is, if there's anything else you want to say or tell people about your book um, and what kind of information they can find in there, okay. uh, here's your chance. Yeah. So one more question. One guy asked, what, um, what software do I use for processing my photos? I'm a huge fan of Luminar. Uh, Luminar 2 2018 is the newest version. And they've the, even the Luminar programmers are Fuji users, and they've made a huge effort into making the X series, the X Trans raw files work great in Luminar. So here's the book. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's full of information. The way it's broken down is I go into it, it basically, I run through, it's set up like a camera manual, or the, the camera controls. Each chapter is a chapter that covers an entire setting, a menu in the settings. So I have an image quality chapter, a focus chapter, a camera settings chapter, and I go through every single setting and feature on the X-Series cameras, and I tell you exactly what each feature does, and I show you or describe exactly how you can use it in your photography. So I give you image examples that show you the effect of, of, of exactly how you can use it. So my goal with the book is to help you expand and be the most creative possible and have the most technical proficiency with the camera. I want you to have the confidence to say, oh, I know that you know, Dan showed me that this picture, I can you know, use this setting to get this style of picture, or in this situation, this will help me capture that in the most, most effective way. So I've, I've written it really easy conversational style. It reads nothing like the manual, uh, and it's incredibly helpful tool. In fact, I was looking for a question. I had a question about the X-T2 the other day. I just couldn't remember a certain setting. I pulled up the manual online and I, I couldn't find it. And so I it's like, forget it. So I picked up the book and I flipped through and I found it in about 10 seconds. So the book, uh, one person asked, does it cover all of the X-H1? Uh, as we were going to press, the X-H1 was announced. And I had actually gotten to see the camera before then. So I do have a page that's that's dedicated to the X-H1. And I mentioned some of the new features that it contains. At the same time, almost every feature in the X-H1 is also found in the X-T2 and most of the other cameras. So if you have an X-H1, the book will cover you pretty much the whole way through. Let's see. Um, the book, Michael asks, uh, the book, uh, the book itself, the print book, we obviously can't update that with every firmware update, but I imagine that in the future we'll do a revision. You know, when, when a lot of features get changed, I'm sure we'll do a second printing. At least hopefully Rocky Nick will let me do that. <laughs> hey, Dan, so I just want to pop in and mention for everyone who's here in the room that we have an offer going right now to receive 40% 40, 40 off your book uh, this week with a special code that's only available to people who came to the webinar or RSVP'd for it. If 
I just want to let people know that works for all versions of Dan's book on the Rocky Nook website. So ebook, or if you get the bundle, which is the print and the ebook, or just the print book, you can save 40% when you use that code. If you miss it in the chat today, tomorrow you'll get a link to uh, the replay of this webinar, and it, that will include the code again in there. Um, so don't worry, you, you'll get it, you'll get to see it. Um, and you can save on the book if you choose to purchase it after this. It looked like a good amount of people when I asked earlier had already purchased the book. So that's cool. Good news. We like to yeah. hear. And, and I really appreciate your support. I'm, I'm thrilled that so many people decided to sign up for the, for the uh, webinar here. And I know a lot of you guys are going to watch it later on YouTube. I just want to thank you for joining me and thank you for your support, buying my eBooks and visiting the blog and supporting Rocky Nook. They're awesome publication. And so I'm just I'm just thrilled that, that uh, so many of you guys have chosen to follow me. I appreciate your support. Great. Well, on that note, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we'll, we will send all the questions and the chat tran chat transcript. That's a little tongue twister to Dan, <laughs> so he can answer some more questions on his blog for you guys. And uh, thanks again for joining us. We'll see you again soon.